Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge, a sidecast to our main podcast where rather than watching a movie one minute at a time, we break down the life of a cool guest one moment at a time. I'm your host, I'm Alan Sanders. I am your co-host, Walt Murray. Well, this uh, this has been an interesting week in uh, world policy, world, I know, foreign policy, world events. You know, we try very hard not to brush too close to the political line, but when the entire world is watching one thing taking place, it's really hard not it's really hard to avoid it. Well, that isn't exactly true. <laughs> There's somebody who's not watching it. He's trying to get his tax bill passed. <laughs> See, and I was worried about our guest last week with my editing. And now you go and say that. <laughs> I don't think you mean the tax bill. I think you mean the budget. Or no, the, but, well, whatever that thing is, the, the it's a tax bill. Yeah, yes, yes. Ultimately. We're going to feel it one way or the other. Well, yes, I, we are. I felt it. <laughs> yes, we are. Well, you know, on a, um, I was going to say lighter note. There's not really a lighter note about this whole thing in Afghanistan. Um, but did you see the uh, headline from the Hill today that there is a group of students trying to get back to Palo yes. Alto, California, yes. who are stranded in Afghanistan because that's where their school trip was this right. year. They did a kind of a mission slash kind of a sightsee trip with parents and kids. And yeah, it's let, let, let me just ask this on your best year. Like everything's cool in Afghanistan. Nothing, you know, like say it's three years ago in Afghanistan. If, if somebody came to you and said, hey, Alan, let's get the kids and let's head to Afghanistan for a week. Look, we could go to Belize. We could maybe go to uh, Costa Rica, Argentina. We could go to the Costa Bahamas, Rica. or we could go to Afghanistan because it's the warm time of year. Oh, right? I've Afghanistan. never been there. Let's just go to a desert and you hang know, out with the kids. I've always wanted to visit a set that looks like I'm on another planet. That's kind of cool. I think that sounds fantastic. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean. Well, and three years ago, honestly, three years ago, I would have been hesitant, but I would have said at least, eh, we kind of have things under control. We've got a bunch of folks there. We've got envoys. We've got an embassy. We've got every one of our NATO partners has an embassy. As long as we stay within maybe those green areas, we'll be okay. Had you said this to me in July of this year, I've been like, hell no. No. But like, why would you even ever go there? That, I mean, there's nothing there. It's desert and I don't camels. Wanna, I don't want to knock it entirely because there is a really cool feel good story that has come out and, and there's not very many right now. But you see the story of the uh, the, the individual, the woman who uh, worked with the robotics team, the all female yeah. robotics mm-hmm. team in Afghanistan, all these girls. And when she realized what was happening and realized that it didn't look like there was going to be much help from the national government, from our federal government leveraged all of her resources and friendships all from here to cut to cutter and into afghanistan here's this mother of 11 yeah harvard grad and she goes in gets these girls and gets them out and back to the united states before everything starts going tango uniform and yeah, that's pretty awesome. the entire girls robotics team from afghanistan like to me see when you say what's there to go see if you had told me that hey we're doing a partnership we've got this these girls that have grown up never knowing what it was like to be under Taliban rule because they've grown up from yeah. infant to 18 now with no knowledge of what it was like to live under that rule. And you said, hey, we want to go meet a bunch of these girls that are just really skilled in robotics. We're going to bring our robotics team. We're going to trade ideas. We're going to, you know, just going to hang out for a couple of weeks and, and see their. Co- I could see where that's an option. I mean, if you're not going into the countryside, you're going to a university, you're going to go in town, you're going to be in a green area, green zone. Yeah, I could see that. But not in July when everything was already starting to go the wrong direction. Right. No, no way. No way. 
you know, so. and, and apologies to the audience. I don't want to go too deep into this, but I mean, it is historic. It is something that is going on. I mean, this is being discussed around the world. This is you. And I know, well, hey, this is a distraction. You're right. And we will get to a distraction on this. I just felt like to not say at least something is also a disservice to what's happening. I, I agree. And um, and needless to say, um, you know, both of us are, um, you know, not to get into religion at all, but both of us are, you know, believe in God and uh, definitely praying for all the people there and just yeah. praying that this has some sort of good resolution and um, just minimal loss of life. I don't even want to pray at this point. I want to be really wrong right now in what I think is going to happen. I want to be, I want to say, oh, I didn't see that coming because right now. Yeah. I, 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 prayer is one thing, but I feel like there are people in, in places that should be doing something. I, I agree. 100%. I, I think it's such a, an unfortunate disaster at this point that, um, you just, you know, you get down to that minimalistic thing of, I just hope the least number of people die as possible. Right. And I mean, it's a, it's such a disaster. So right. it's hard not to be cynical and, uh, and frustrated. Um, All right. Well, I'm going to pull us back a little bit. We've, we've said our piece. We're going to let that lie. Um, sometimes weather, we keep talking about this in the last few weeks, but weather really screwed with me. I've got a pattern, you know, down here in the South, you've got a, you've got to pretty much have a regular routine with lawn maintenance. Otherwise you're going to get screwed very, very quickly. What was that show you mentioned a few weeks back that you watched about what happens if we go like when humans are gone, oh. how quickly the vegetation takes over everything. Yeah. It's like an afternoon in Georgia. Yeah. I, mean, um, yeah, I missed, yeah, I missed my lawn like life cutting. after life after man or something like that. Yeah, life after yeah. man. My, my, my lawn cutting was only delayed by four days. Like you think four days. Yeah. Yeah. My lawnmower stalled almost two dozen times. It took me a little over two hours. I started just as like 645. So it wasn't even sunset. And by the time I was done, I barely had enough light from the already set sun because it was nearly 9 p.m. It was ridiculous. I didn't get a chance to do the edging or any of the weed whacking. I was like, and I don't know what's flying around Georgia right now. I had some regular mosquito bites, you know, that kind of turn like a little tiny red pimple and they go away. I've got seven or eight like knots the size of a of a nickel on my neck, on my shoulder, on my forearm. So I don't know what that was, but that's not fun. Well, I've told you about the guy I used to work with that every story anybody ever told he was like, oh, that ain't nothing. Well, I hate to be that guy today. OK, <laughs> but Friday afternoon, <laughs> one up me. I got stung <clears throat> and I basically slept all day Saturday, most of the day Sunday. <laughs> and my leg looked like it was on fire. And I mean, like it was, it was nasty. Like I thought maybe I've got a blood clot or something. <laughs> and I ended up having to uh, do the teledoc thing on Monday. Really? And he prescribed a bunch of stuff and uh, like steroid cream. And I've been on Benadryl. I'm on like my fourth Benadryl today still. How are you awake? I, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll see how long it lasts. I, I was just excited about our guest today, I guess. Yeah. But well, do you know what it was? It was like brutal. Ants? Um, no, it's some kind of flying something. And it only got yeah. stung once. Uh, as far as I know. I mean, it looks like there are two or three other places. I, I may have gone through a nest of them. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you they know what? brutalized me. Knock on wood. I have never had sort of like, you know, I know a lot of people who say like the first time you got stung by something, it wasn't a big deal. The second time a little more, and but it builds every time and their body sort of overreacts, I guess, a hyper re immune response. That's kind of the problem. I haven't had that issue, thankfully, because I get stung by anything and everything that's flying around because I'm just an idiot. I'll go like weed whacking or I'm trimming shrubs and I'm not even paying attention. Oh, what's that papery thing with all those insects flying in and out? Let me just go ahead and cut it in half. That's that won't be a problem. They won't, oh, no, they're not that won't be a problem at all. Not a problem I, at all. Actually, one time I, I had a lot more. I, go, I went over the ground uh, wasp nest, you know, the ones that make the hole in the ground. Oh, yeah. And the lawnmower sucked a bunch of them out and they weren't happy going through the blades and stick, you know, flying out the side. Yes. And so I realized what had happened. I was like, OK, time to run, which I did. I looked like an idiot to anybody else who didn't know what I was running from. But, you know, you do the whole, you know, invisible Kung Fu where you're like flapping around and trying to run. I yes, got all I've the way to the that. driveway and I will never forget this. I turned back to look where I left the lawnmower and see if I was safe. And I swear to God, I saw the, 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 the ground wasp 
come flying at my face and it literally stung me on my nose. That's brutal. I'm like, how the hell? (laughs) And I saw it and I couldn't do anything about it. And I had like this big knot and I already have a big enough nose. And it was like, I was like, hello. (laughs) My kids looked at me like, what the dad? Did somebody punch you in the face? I'm like, no, I just got stung by a wasp. (laughs) Welcome to Georgia. You go cut the lawn now. I ain't cutting the lawn. (laughs) So. Well, I think I told you one time I'm an idiot, you know, well, that's, and we've, we've heard episodes. Yeah. <laughs> and we had one of those nests in our backyard. And so I thought, you know, the, probably the best thing to do is to pour gasoline down that sucker. That actually works if you're OK with getting away in time. Therein lies the problem. <laughs> Whenever you pour gasoline down something, the inclination is throw the match in and watch it blow. <laughs> Don't watch it blow. Run. <laughs> To the hills because it was like I saw the explosion and then I saw the swarm. Uh huh. And man, those things got all in my shirt, in my jeans. <laughs> I don't know how many times I got stung that day, but I yeah. think that started me down the path of being hyper allergic to these things. Could very well be. Um, because you know what I heard, and the reason I, I I know the story about the one that came at my face, they leave a little bit of a pheromone behind, and yep. it's a tracking me- uh, mechanism for all the other ones to come find you. Yes, that's what I've heard too. And uh, they were trying to come after me after the first one. I managed to get inside, but I was like, holy crap. So, all right. Well, that's fun with Georgia. I'm ready for our first frost. I'm ready for our first cold. I'm ready for all snow. Of, uh, yes, I'll, I'll take anything right now versus what I'm dealing with outside. Just, just cool it off so that way it doesn't grow so fast right now. Absolutely. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to shift gears to our guests. This is that time we've, we've wasted the audience's time enough. And, you know, we're slowly working our way through the staff of Radio Labyrinth. And I know this guy joined a little bit after Tim and uh, and uh, Jeff started, started the show, but I know he's got a background. He's done some other things and he's now taken the the Radio Labyrinth podcast into a video direction, I believe. And we're going to talk to him a little bit about that and talk about his background, radio, how he met up with the guys. So before we can do any of that, we've got to actually welcome him to the stage. So, folks, I want you to put your hands together for a warm welcome to our guest, Dustin Lawler. Yay. Hey, Dustin, guys. Thanks for absolutely having me. Absolutely. Welcome to the Listener's Lounge. Hopefully you enjoyed the uh, the green room, the snacks and everything were okay while you were waiting. Yeah, I was uh, listening to uh, you guys talk about the wasp situation and <laughs> well, the, the, the one thing that you need to make sure you do with the whole gasoline in the hole, the key is don't throw a match. The gas does it. Just oh, let really? it sit. Yeah. There's yeah. There's, there's no reason to there's burn. There's no the show. Gas. If you well, do that, yeah. you need there to is a reason <laughs> to burn it. <laughs> oh that, that, yeah. Just, just your own, your own yeah, <laughs> right. need to kill. But besides that, <laughs> yeah, it, the, uh, yeah, the, the gas does it on its own. That's, that's actually good to know. You know what I, I did learn when I was a kid, because the first time I did it, much like Walt, I was a little too close, more because the flame came out a lot closer to my face than I wanted it to. So I learned to lead a little trail of gasoline a little further away, <laughs> light the match at the end and watch it then go into the hole. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's my uh, my day job uh, is I work with the uh, one of the well, the country's largest lawn care company oh and so i'm a horticultural specialist with them so yeah i deal with uh, the wasps and the bugs this every day. is so fortuitous i was getting ready to call into like wsb's green and growing i don't have to do that now we're going to spend the next 20 minutes on lawn care <laughs> here we go <laughs> folks get your notebooks out we're going to start talking about why my lawn went to sh- halfway through the summer <laughs> <laughs> no seriously i won't do that but i will talk to you afterwards <laughs> yeah no problem um yeah. All right. Well, let's get to it. First and foremost, we always like to go to the sort of set the back, the machine as far back as we can to the to what's relevant to the story. You're part of the uh, the, the Radio Labyrinth podcast, but you weren't part of the maybe the the initial formation. How did that sort of gel? When did you first sort of meet Jeff and and Tim and kind of become part of that podcast team? Well, I, me and Jeff are both big fans of Kevin Smith. And so I had met Jeff online years ago um, in the whole Kevin Smith message board um, world and knew who he was, had no idea that he lived in Georgia. Uh, It was one of those things where I thought he lived up north (laughs) and, you know, he was a friend of mine online, but that was as far as he took it. And then one day he posted when they'd started a podcast and this was probably 
So they started the They're end of 15. So it was probably like mid 16. Yeah. And um, started listening to it. Really liked it. I liked the the feeling of of three or four friends sitting down and talking about TV and movies and would listen to it religiously. Well, I started noticing they didn't have a, a, any real representation online. So I started a Facebook group um, just for actually it was for me and them to post things that were funny memes and, and jokes about the podcast. And then all of a sudden people started wanting to join. And before I knew it, I had, you know, a few hundred people in there that, that were all, you know, gung ho about the podcast. So I rode that for a couple of years. Um, only really in the last two years um, did I become part of the podcast, mostly through artwork to begin with. I would do things for them, stickers, um, images and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, in the last, when COVID hit, Tim started putting out the podcast on uh, that they were recording on wasn't Zoom at the time. I think it was um, may have even been something as rudimentary as Skype, mm -hmm. but they um, they started posting those on YouTube and I'm a big YouTube fan. Uh, I've, I've been on there for years watching stuff and I saw what they were putting out and I was like, man, uh, could I do something with the video and just kind of make it clean it up a little bit and try to make it, you know, a little more presentable. And he was like, yeah, man, have at it. And so I started doing that and then I really started getting into manipulating it and editing it more. And he was finally, he, you know, about a year and a half ago, he was like, Hey, why don't you come on the podcast uh, since you've been with us for so long in the background and, you know, start being the fourth. And um, Ira is usually the fourth, but he's, he's there maybe, uh, you know, quarter of the year and then he travels a lot doing work and stuff so I, I was filling in for ira for a while and then i just kind of took his place that's that's really cool that just goes to show that and i know stephanie had a similar story stephanie swain about being a fan following him on radio and then sort of just being involved and not being the the fanatical fan not being the you know that pushy fan that everybody in the group is going dear lord it's that person again you know just being there to help and trying to drive things and and next thing you know, uh, opportunities open up. Were you, did you ever think of yourself as maybe thinking that sort of podcaster, broadcaster? Did you ever have that in your mind as something you'd want to do? Yeah. Yeah, I did. From when I was younger, um, I was in bands, you know, all through high school, well, a band uh, through high school and then after high school um, for probably about 13 years, I was in a band. And so I was always doing, you know, choral things at school or, um, you know, things where I would be on stage theater, things like that. And, and so when this popped up, I loved podcasts. I've listened to them since their inception. I mean, around 2007, I've been listening to them since then pretty much daily. So I knew what they were and always, you know, it was one of those things where you don't want to start the whole thing on your own from scratch, mm -hmm. but if someone was willing to let me in and, and, and just jump on with them. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> and I enjoy it. It's great. It's, it's a fun way to, uh, to have a weekly conversation when life kind of gets in the way of having those conversations daily with people, you know? Yeah. So you said that you and Jeff were, um, were buddies from the Kevin Smith boards. Uh, what was it that drew you to Kevin Smith and what, what are your favorite Kevin Smith movies? Oh man. Um, what drew me to Kevin Smith? Well, like I said, I was in a band uh, at the, about the same time I joined the band and we started recording uh, stuff and, and being a little more serious with the band. And I thought it was going to be my career. That was around the same time that he created Clerks and came out with it with his debut. And I liked the way that he was able to film a movie on his own, you know, using credit cards <laughs> and you know, just paid for all of it himself, rented everything, edited everything, done it all, completed it, and then was able to sell it and start a career. And so I, I always followed him just, you know, for his work ethic alone. Um, you know, everyone thinks of Kevin Smith as this big stoner guy <laughs> that makes these comedy movies. But the funny part is he didn't really start smoking a lot of weed until he hit 40. <laughs> it was all kind of uh, it was all kind of for show before then. Uh, and so people didn't take him seriously, but I knew I, I had faith in in his ability to, you know, create and write. And um, he's an excellent, you know, comedic writer. So I followed him 
through everything. I joined a you know Facebook group for him, and I'm now an, you know an admin on that group, the world of Kevin Smith. We've got about I think we just hit forty thousand members. Wow. So I mean, it's and so I get inundated with everything Kevin Smith all the time. So it's it's weird. It, it, things that become a hobby and then become a mild job. <laughs> um, you you think about them a little a little differently. You know, I, I don't I don't kind of shy away from it you know, like I would with anything else after it becomes kind of so monotonous for so many years, you know, with him, I've always been interested in what he's doing and he's always been putting out, you know, good quality stuff. Some of them better than others. Sure. Uh, my favorites will probably be dogma yeah. and red state. Yeah. Dogma. Uh, yeah. It, 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 that's my personal favorite. And maybe because I was raised Catholic and mm -hmm. I also have a sense of humor and I can, I can actually poke fun at the things that I still hold sacred and not feel like I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Sure. I was, well, my father was a Baptist minister, so I grew, I'm a preacher's kid and <laughs> you're uh, already screwed. So. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I already had that, you know, that's from hitting, uh, you know, growing up as a, a, on the front pew, you know, my whole childhood and then hitting teenaged angst and rebellion. Um, yeah, I, I I definitely can relate to a lot of the things that Kevin talks about in Dogma. Baptist, not not Catholic, but there's this there's the same sense of of uh, pushback, I believe. Well, yeah, just depending uh, how much guilt you had foisted upon you as a child. I mean, I made the joke that I switched from the Catholic Church to the Episcopal Church because it was the same prayers but half the guilt, so it was kind of cool. It was like Catholic <laughs> light. I, 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 found, right, well, I found the diet version of religion for me, so I could <laughs> I could handle it without like getting too stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always grew up around the church and um, was friends with the pastor's kids. And I always thought the hardest job in the world was the, the family of a pastor. I mean, you're just under the microscope all the time. Anything you do, you know, is uh, is over evaluated. And I always just thought, man, that has to just be a really tough way to grow up. As far as it being a tough way to grow up, it, it's it, you do have a lot of things pushed upon you as far as, you know, people want you to be the best, you know, think of you in that same way they think of your father. And that wasn't the case uh, with me. Um, I, I definitely was a little bit of a you know, wild child growing up. And so it was uh, it was funny because people saw that in me and would realize who I was. And so they would try to act differently around me, yeah. you know, like, mm. they, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they, and I was like, I'm worse than you. <laughs> <laughs> See my dad. I'm not that. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not him. And, and maybe that led to a lot of the, you know, the, me being in wild was because I was trying not to be that person that, mm. that he was, but isn't that often the case between either the preacher's kid or the sheriff's kid? Like you, you, you don't want to be thought of as the same person that you're, you know, under the same roof of. So you almost go too far the opposite direction sometimes. True. Uh, but, yeah, very true. Yeah. Well, I've always wanted to do a podcast where I interviewed other FBI agents, kids, because man, <laughs> a lot of us are hell on wheels. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that rebellion. There's, but you know what? That's what makes you a great podcast partner. The stories, <laughs> <laughs> the stories are great. Yeah, the stories are are amazing. <laughs> and they're so good, they're even worth retelling. And I laugh every time you tell them. Because I have visuals in my head. <laughs> so, all right. So let's, uh, let's pull around to uh, the YouTube piece. Because that is something that I have jokingly told Walt. Because we added a piece in season four here. We used to do a Bring Out Your Dead segment. But we started running out of funny obits. And I think some people were like, it's still an obit. Should you make fun of that? I'm like, well, a lot of people wrote their own. And so we were reading theirs. But anyway, we changed it to, all right, we're going to find a terrible, terrible C-list movie, maybe a D-list, and make them watch it. I'm starting to believe if we could figure out somebody, because Walt can't do it, to film and edit his reactions to these bad movies, we could actually have a funny reaction channel. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, reaction channels are are huge right now. I, I'm I'm a few episodes ago, you were, you kind of went off on the reaction videos and, and talked about them, how much you enjoyed them. And I've been watching them for a couple of years now. I mean, nightly, mm -hmm. you know, I've got my same people that I go to the five or six that, that I uh, watch. 
And I think it's probably the best. People don't agree with me, but I think it's probably the best thing on YouTube right now is reaction videos. You get to see a whole generation of people interpret something that you love or hate and see how they react to it, see how a new generation looks at things that you thought of completely differently. Um, you know, I've got one, Brandon Loves Movies is, is probably my favorite one. And he is a young guy. He's probably like 26, 27. And, I, you know, I don't understand how a lot of these kids have never seen all these movies. Before. I know it. And so, you know, he, he starts watching, you know, never seen the Indiana Jones series before. It's like, w- what kind of childhood did you have? Right. So, um, so yeah, you know, that's, I love people watching anyway, you know, anywhere else. And this is like the best form of people watching because, you know, the content so well that the movie is after a while, the movies become a, a side part of what you're watching. You know, the enjoyment is watching those people and how they react to it. Right. But I think, yeah, I think you guys should definitely start one, especially with all those really crappy movies that you make him watch. (laughs) I think it'd be awesome. (laughs) And they are, I've seen, I've seen a lot of them too, just out of (laughs) sheer boredom. And yeah, that's, that's something no one should, you know, no one should be put this week may even be the worst yet. Let, let's what uh, you got going this week? Oh. <laughs> you want to give us it's a, a you, you 2017's a nightmare toxic shark. Oh man, <laughs> that's the one with the shark with the radioactive symbol barrel and the thing. Yes, yeah, I've, yeah. The fact that you know that, Dustin, I know, I know, <laughs> and, and it shoots green goop <laughs> on people. Yeah. I, I mean, it's horrible, it's so freaking bad. <laughs> did, did you ever did you ever watch Lava Lantula? <laughs> no, but I'm sure I will be watching that sometime here in the near future. <laughs> that, Lava that, is a, that is an exquisite uh, crappy movie. Uh, it's got a, a radio DJ from L.A. He used to be on K-Rock, uh, Ralph Garman. Uh, great guy, does wonderful, you know, does voices kind of a lot, kind of like a Tim character. He does a lot of voices, oh. for, you know, comedian. They got him for a part in this and it's very small, but um I watched it for that reason only just to see him. And it was painful, literally <laughs> painful to watch the entire movie, but I did <laughs> lava lantula. See, I think even though like for me watching these millennials or maybe even Gen Zers on the cusp of like in that sort of almost in between walking that line, watching the movies of the eighties or maybe even the nineties that you're like, how did you still not see this? How did, how did you have such a sheltered childhood that your parents didn't say, we've got to at least show you these sets of movies. For me, I get the enjoyment of watching them enjoy it for the very first time. Cause you know, we'll never get a chance to see that movie for the first time ever again, but we kind of get to see it from someone else's perspective. I wonder what someone's reaction is going to be to watch Walt just go, Oh God. Oh, just start wailing and gnashing his teeth from being forced to watch a crappy movie. Well, that's the, that's the good part. That's that's the part that gets people in is that is that knee jerk reaction, whether it's good, bad. You know, I, I just I think it's the only part that, about it that makes me com- that gives me some kind of comfort is the fact that you can watch kids nowadays learn who like John Hughes is. Mm-hmm. from the you know from the start you know they'll they'll they're like oh that's a this is a john hughes movie he what he was that you know he did that other one and you see it like start to click in their head like you know you know this was a great filmmaker and uh you know his movies his kinds of movies those are that was a time capsule of a couple of decades or a couple of three decades that you know yeah. we'll never get again. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the one thing, that, and this is ironically, this is great because I know we were going to do this because you being involved with Radio Labyrinth, which is a cultural podcast talking about not only being Gen Xers or at least recognizing the films and the culture of the Gen X generation because of Tim and Jeff, you also know the new movies and it's always fun to have that. But speaking of YouTube, one of the things that I got into a discussion with with people is, yeah, John Hughes, those movies may feel dated. Like everybody goes, oh, this looks like an 80s movie. But you go beneath the veneer and almost every John Hughes film still applies because it's about the relationships of usually teenagers growing up, angst. My girls, when they sat down and watched Breakfast Club, for the first 15 minutes, they were like rolling their eyes saying, I can't believe we're watching this movie. It looks like it was shot for TV. It's it doesn't look like it, there's no special effects. There's no. And by the end, they were like, oh, my God, 
we have these exact same things in our high school. Then we don't call them the same names, but we've got those same clicks. Yeah, the uh, that that spans generations. You know, the, those relationships, those problems, those issues with parents, with teachers. You know, those things don't ever change. They just, you know, the only thing that changes is the veneer of whatever decade you happen to be in. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's it's fun. Now, if you want to get back to Radio Labyrinth, kind of going into YouTube, um, I wanted, I've always thought that our show would would come across like a talk show, like a television talk show. We, you know, it's set up in segments. Uh, Tim is. Tim is Tim. He can, he can, Tim uh, is Tim. That is Tim true. Is Tim. I want a t-shirt. I think it's our next sticker is Tim is Tim. He, he definitely, um, wish all of them were very leery to get in front of the camera. Um, it, cause if you look at some of the first, I'd say I, I'd started last July about, you know, a little before dragon con last year, taking over doing YouTube full time with them. And, you know, I, I was learning as I went as well. I, I'm, you know, I have a background more in music and recording that way, but in video, it was all new to me. Um, huge fan of the, of, you know, the media. So I, I, I knew what I wanted it to look like, but the process and, and, you know, the, the time it took me to learn the software and everything, you can definitely watch it happen week by week uh, over the last year, but in the last, I'd say since January, February of this year, we I've really kind of, I felt more comfortable with it and kind of got a nice, uh, setup and structure, uh, going, but that's what I was, that's what my goal was, was to make, you know, a podcast that you can watch most of the time when you watch podcasts, it's, it's four, four heads or three heads talking on a screen. And that can be fun for facial reactions, but, um, sometimes I like to play with, you know, making it seem more like you're setting, um, kind of not sketch comedy, but, but with that mindset of sketch comedy. So that's what I've been trying to do with radio labyrinth podcast on YouTube. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been going well. We've, we've probably had the biggest jump when we started splitting off into, we started doing like you guys have the listeners lounge. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Radio Labyrinth Presents. Uh, so that's, you know, separate from the podcast. You know, the podcast comes out every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. on YouTube and on the RSS feeds for audio. Um, but on Wednesdays at 7 a.m., we release our presents. And those can be interviews or uh, deep dives on a movie or um, just anything that's off from the podcast. And so lately we've been doing a lot of interviews. And those interviews have been wildly successful on YouTube, um, more so view wise than than the podcast. But that's to be expected just from some of the guests we've been having They They have their own followings right um, out in the world. So, well, I think and, and whether I like it or not, you know, because podcasting, I love because I'm in radio and I love the the medium of talk and the fact that. If you close your eyes, you're still hearing the voice and you can conjure images and thoughts and ideas. But the younger generation, and I hate sounding like that, the younger kids, they're visually driven. They want to see. Even if they have YouTube on in the background, they may not be watching it the whole time, but they'll use it as the mechanism rather than a podcast or the radio. They're, they just so they can flip around. And, you know, we actually were very early on, although there's no animation, there's no nothing. We very early on ported the audio to YouTube of all of our episodes. So that way you could listen via YouTube. Now I'm kind of thinking we're behind now figuring out how to make it more visually stimulating for the audience. Yeah, a lot of people are porting uh, stuff over with, with like a visualizer or just something that jumps a little bit with the vocals. You know, um, and then, but my kids do the exact same thing. You know, they'll have a phone going with YouTube on the side while they're playing a video game. And I'm like, what, why aren't, what are you doing? You're, 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 why aren't you watching what you're, you're playing? And they're like, well, I'm playing the game. I was like, okay, well, we'll turn that off and play the game. And they're like, no, I'm, I'm listening to this guy play this game while I'm playing this game. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So, you know, it took me a hurdle to get over the, you know, a little bit to get over that. But once I started getting into YouTube myself and seeing what was available on there, 
you know, everything you like, you know, like you said, you can have podcasts, you can also have, you know, audio books. I'm a huge audio book nut. And so I understand multitasking when it comes to your entertainment. Now, I was a little put off by it to begin with, because I guess I go, you know, back to that old mindset of one, one media at a time. Yes, I'm right. still, um, I, 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 I'm still that way. I know. And well, I, I, we've had some podcasters on our show who say they edit their podcast while listening to another podcast. I'm like, I, I how can't, do I can't you imagine do that. No. Like, how can no. you do that? Well, I have to shut down everything and focus on what I'm doing. That's just yeah. how I am. Yeah, me too. I, I couldn't, I couldn't listen. My wife sometimes asks me, she goes, well, you're in there for so long. Why don't you listen to music while you're doing it? I'm like, I, I'm listening to what's going on. Right. You know, some of the, you know, we do two shows a week and, and I'm, I'm at least spending 12 hours during the week. Yeah. Probably, uh, you know, editing. Yeah. For, for a couple of, you know, it's about six hours an episode. Yeah. Um, and I do the audio now as well. So I'm, I'm producing not only the video, um, podcast but i'm also doing the, the audio since tim's i think we, i started that when he went on uh maternity leave but <laughs> we'll, we'll oh, say yeah. maternity <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. but yeah so so uh, well, but, he's but, yeah that's why patreon dollars and funnel them your way i mean you got to get at least something for it uh there's we've we're working on uh monetization for a few different things good but yeah that's 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 um that 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 i, I never really questioned i mean i started doing all of this as a volunteer and asking for this burden. Mm -hmm. It's not a burden, but it feels sometimes like a responsibility now that, I, that I've shouldered um, that I'm, I'm, I have no qualms about doing it. You know, there's nights where I, I literally will stay up if I don't have to work the next day and we have a release the next day, I'll stay up all night long, you know, editing and getting it ready for the next, cause I want it to, I want it to succeed. So I want, I want it to, uh, I want to give it my all. And, and if, it, if there's monetization later and that comes, you know, comes in great. If there's not, then I'm just want to be proud of what I put out. Well, this is our chance to insert a PSA for all of our listeners. We need, we need a Dustin. We need somebody like that who wants to step up. <laughs> yes. Because I know I'm taxed <laughs> with everything I do because I've got not just this show, but two other ones. So I am, but yeah, I, that's awesome though. That is really cool that you have the, the passion and the drive and and you started off as literally a fan and now you're helping to drive content, which is really neat. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I love the podcast so much. I never really thought about being a part of it, but now that I am, I couldn't really think of doing anything else. So when you, um, when you're talking about all these different mediums, I, to me, I've, the thing I've liked about podcast is that it's almost like a, a radio show without a boss and without, um, you know, without uh, someone standing over your shoulder going, Oh, you can't say the F word or you can't do this. So it, it kind of allowed for more of a raw organic feel to it as things are moving forward. And, it, you know, as we were looking at podcasting, making that jump to YouTube and things like that, how do you think that's going to change the world of YouTube or the world of podcasting? Uh, or do you think it will? I don't think it, I don't think it will change anything. There's the, the, the ocean is so full of podcasts. The, the, the format as it stands now is so large that I don't think that you could, that, adding another facet to it will change it. I think it will maybe subdivide some of it. You'll have some people that take advantage more of the video aspect uh, as a, you know, in conjunction with the audio. Um, but, you know, the standard podcasts, you know, they've been around, you know, over 10 years now. <clears throat> and that's usually the, the benchmark of, you know, a fad, <clears throat> excuse me, a fad or something of that nature. So, I don't think that people are are going to change it or it's going to be different. I think that freedom is there and that's the draw uh, of of people starting one. For me listening to them and being so excited about what they were was less a, well I, I thought of it as a radio show yes, but more especially with the Kevin Smith stuff, it was him and his friends. And it was at a time in my life when I was working, you know, 14 hours a day, 6 days a week. I didn't have time for friends. I didn't have time for conversations. Mm. 
Um, and so that was that release for me. It was it was a way to you know feel like I was having a, a friendship or a, a conversation where I was silent um, and I was sitting in on friends talking. And that was enough for me to go, hey, I, I can get my my fix of friendship <laughs> at, at my own leisure. You know, and that way I can, and, and I guess that is kind of self-isolating, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's better than setting, stewing in your own thoughts. I yeah. Believe. It's like Billy Joel. We're sharing a drink we call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I know exactly what you mean. I think Walt, you and I have talked about this. The podcast we like are the ones where suddenly you feel like even though you're only listening because of social media, because so many podcasts want you to interact via their Twitter or their Facebook, you can reach out when you've been listening or you can tweet something very quickly back saying, well, wait a minute, what about this? And then they respond. And all of a sudden you start feeling like you're part of that audience. You start feeling, even though it's may have been something that was recorded a year ago, they'll still respond depending on what it is with the subject. You know, when you're doing movies or movie reviews or whatever, and you start feeling like you're part of that inner circle. And that feels kind of special. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is one of the, the crazy things about the world of podcasting for most podcasts. The, the hosts are very accessible. I mean, you're always going to have the Conan O'Briens who've jumped into the podcasting world and he's still as isolated as he's ever been, but you can, I mean, I, as busy as I am, if somebody reaches out and sends me a note and has a question about a show or, you know, an episode or whatever, I really try to sit down and send them a quick note and say, Hey, thanks for, for reaching out. And I can't remember episode six of <laughs> young Frankenstein, but if you'll remind me, I'll answer your question. <laughs> I think, I mean, to me, that's, we've got a guy right now who's been, I guess, binging through blazing saddles and he'll put comments in our listeners group. Like, why did you not I've think about him. this? Or what were you thinking here? Or I'm like, well, we kind of talked that one to death, but you know, Hey, let me just add to it. We're not going to cover everything. There's no way we could possibly cover every possible nuance or detail or see it. Maybe the way you see it, we can only see it the way we saw it, but thank you for, for, for commenting and hopefully you're enjoying it. Yeah. And there are several times I've been like, did I agree with that? <laughs> or did I disagree with that? I can't remember now. <laughs> So I'm I'm very open to an opinion on that one. Well, yeah, and sometimes you your opinions change. You know, you 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 might have thought one way when you were recording, and then a year later, it's like, mm, yeah, you're right. I, I I could completely do a 180 on that if I looked at it again. And I love yeah. I love how dynamic. And even though we recorded it a couple of years ago, or you know, th four, three years ago, when it comes to Young Frankenstein, two when it comes to Blazing Saddles they're still relevant because they're not dated because the movies are a lot, you know, it's not like we're talking about what happened in the news this week and it becomes aged, you know, within a couple of weeks. These are movies that people can go watch today for the first time. I've actually watched reaction videos of people responding to blazing saddles for the very first time or young Frankenstein for the very first time. And they're always green as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And particularly with Young Frankenstein, to me, I can still go back and watch it and see things I've never seen before. Which is crazy, yeah. considering the amount of detail we saw the first time. I know. <laughs> it's nuts. So, Did those have any of those? See, I was, I was, the only thing I've always been afraid of that minute by minute format would be that I wouldn't care for the movie afterwards. Um, so I would far, burn it up. I think so far, Walt, you and I are two and oh, we, we love the movies even more going through. Yeah, them. Yep, uh, we I did agree. several movies for our Patreon page and we broke them down more in like chunks rather than minute by minute and still loved the movies. And in fact, I think with Poltergeist, Walt, you were sort of eh, not my favorite. And you're like, wow, by the time we got to the end, you were yeah, really and even I, for I me, definitely. Yeah. And um, that and I've always loved the big Lebowski. But now I'm I'm much more cognizant of it. It it really comes to mind a lot more often now than it did before. Mm -hmm. And um and I've I've probably recommended it to 20 or 30 people since we did it again. And it just wasn't one that was always at the forefront of my mind. But those two, Poltergeist and Big Lebowski, obviously two very different movies really struck me in that format a lot harder than they had before. And and here's an example where 
I am not a huge fan of Christmas Vacation. I, I just, for whatever reason, that level or style of humor, I get why some things are funny, and I do think a few things, but I don't revere it like, let's say, Walt does. But yet, breaking down the pieces and forcing myself to analyze what's happening makes me enjoy looking at a movie, even if it's not my favorite. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool how they framed it, or this is cool how they did this, or oh, by the way, we found out that you know Chevy Chase hadn't memorized that whole speech. Everybody's holding cardboard, you know. I mean, things like that are still kind of neat to me, and so I'll still talk about a movie and have a fascination for it, even if it's not my favorite. Yeah, appreciating appreciating a movie piecemeal is is a, sometimes, especially with those, you know, the the vacation movies are in general, you know, a series of small sketches, mm -hmm. you know, at, at each part. And, and yeah, you watch it all at once. You can, I could definitely see Christmas vacation. It can be a chore because it's played so much in the holidays, kind of like a Christmas story mm -hmm. where you, where you, you look at the whole movie, but if you did, if you kind of zero in on some of these jokes, they're genius, Yeah, but they get looked over a lot. No, I think actually my appreciation went up because we did the dive, because we had a chance to even interview Beverly D'Angelo and learn a little bit more behind the scenes. And maybe because I was watching it in smaller, maybe for me, more digestible chunks rather than trying yeah. to just shove it all in at once. Well, and it, it is interesting, too. I could not believe that Beverly D'Angelo was willing to come on a podcast with two knuckleheads from Georgia <laughs> who she had never heard of. But it is interesting how some of the the artists involved in these movies appreciate the fact that there is a fan base out there that still wants to talk about this movie they did 25 years ago or 35 years ago. And it's really cool that uh, she and Burton Gilliam were willing to come on and talk about those movies uh, with us. That gave me an even deeper appreciation for the movies as well. And I, I would think that the fans would, how do y'all find that on radio labyrinth, Dustin, as y'all, cause y'all are interviewing people all the time and you have some great guests that come on. Yeah. Do you find that you gain a deeper appreciation for their shows or, or are there any that you're like, I will never watch that after having this jackass on our show. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, luckily we haven't had the jackass scenario yet. <laughs> Everyone that's been on has been great. Um, and yeah, I do, uh, have a better appreciation. Recently, we just had, uh, Wesley, Yor and Kathy Coleman, um, Will and Holly from yeah. Land of the Lost mm -hmm. on, and, uh, they're going to be at Dragon Con. So we had them on and, you know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born in 75. So I was a little, little young for Land of the Lost, uh, when it came out, I do remember it as a kid. Um, but I didn't put as much thought into it as, as Tim and Jeff and Steph for sure. Um, but, you know, going back and looking at some of that stuff now, hearing their stories and, and seeing, you know, what, how they thought of it, a show that was made, you know, close 50 years ago mm -hmm. and, and still, you know, they're out there right now enjoying talking to fans and talking, you know, to us about the show. Yeah. It, it gave me an appreciation of, of of what they're, what they do and what they've been through in their life and to, and I'm getting older now. So looking back on things that I, I did in my twenties, if someone was that excited and wanted to talk to me about those things. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would give some type of validation to the career that you had have, or, you know, continue to have. So, yeah, I think that I appreciate it. What the, you know, these people that we see their stuff, if they're current, you know, we, you know, it's great if they've, if they've long since retired and we're talking about something that they did 50 years ago, it gives me an appreciation and, and kind of a, you know, a good feeling that, you know, we're, we're extending that relationship for them. Right. You know, you know, brought, you know, creating that bridge for, you know, maybe someone that hasn't heard of it or, or hasn't, you know, doesn't know anything about it, regard you know, what, regardless of what it is. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I enjoy looking back and seeing some of this stuff. I didn't really watch that as much. I was more of a fan of the Will Ferrell version and they hated the, all of that. So <laughs> oh, it was you know, interesting. I, so, I wondered what they, their thoughts were. Yeah, they, they didn't like that at all. And, uh, so, you know, but, <clears throat> you know, respect to them for, you know, that's, that was their, their, their show. And that was, you know, that's what they 
worked for for free, which was crazy. I didn't know they didn't get paid to really? be on the show. Yeah, they didn't get paid until the third season. Um, and because they started marketing lunch boxes and you know thermoses and t-shirts yeah. and and putting their faces on stuff, and they hadn't made a dime. That's why the the original father left and the uncle came in season three was because the father was like, Hey, I'm out of here. You know, you're yeah. not paying me for anything. Wow. So, I wouldn't have lasted long not getting paid on a a show like that, but <laughs> I mean it's cool to work under the same people that did Star Trek and all their, you know, monsters yeah. and and everything. But but yeah, I think you know, you got to be compensated for what you're right. doing. Well, you know, it reminds me, you know, talk about uh, comparing the classic to the original. One of the few things Gene Wilder ever seemed to be negative on <laughs> was the remake of Willy Wonka. Or now, of course, they made it Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And he just, you could tell he probably had worse things he would say, but even to publicly say it was nonsense. I mean, and I feel the yeah, same him, way. Yeah. Yeah. For him to say anything negative is is a leap anyway yeah but to publicly say that you know about that 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 meant something to him yeah and i don't bl- i don't blame him i mean that's that's a that's a legacy that he created and it was all him mm-hmm. and you know someone is now having to you know manipulate that and I, w- I would probably feel the same way yeah before he passed away one of the things i loved there was an interview where someone said do you have an issue? You're, you're, you know, you're in your, your late stages of life and kids will still say Willy Wonka he goes, no, that, that to me means I need to always be on my game. I don't want them to see me hurting or frail or looking sickly. I want them to think there's Willy Wonka. And to that to me is why we do our, that's why we love Gene Wilder. I mean, because he's awesome, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Robin Williams was the same way. That was his thing. He was, he said, man, I think he was filming um he was filming the movie with Ben Affleck. Um Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. And they were out on the street and someone yelled across the street, Mork. And Ben looked at him and was like, Do you ever get sick of that? And he was like, No. He was like, That's that's me. That's my thing. He said, I would never get sick of any of that. That's why I did it. And that was uh, that that kind of resonated with me. It was like, you know, people look at people's careers and they look at small things in people's careers and kind of pass them over and don't realize that how how much they mean to the to the um, to the actor or or creator, Mm -hmm. Um, no matter how small it is or how old or dated it is. It's still a part of, you know, their of who they are. Maybe it's a it's a generational thing, because I mean, Walt, I'm, I'm pretty sure you feel the same way. I was raised and I did a lot of theater where, you know, it was like sometimes you'd be in front of an audience of 12 and you've been working all these weekends and hours and building sets and everything. You're like, and I would have to, when I would direct shows, I'd say, look, I don't care if there's 12 or 1200, they all paid the same entry fee. They're all do the same performance. And that's been just drilled into me since day one is I don't care how few or how many in the audience, they deserve the very best I can do. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, I've tried to instill that in my kids that it doesn't matter what the audience is. Ultimately, you need to do your best. Mm-hmm. And mu- music was the same way. You know, I was in a band. It was, you know, if there's three people out there or there's 300, you know, you put on, you put on a show. That's, on that's show. what you're there for. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and you just don't know what things mean to people. Um, Steven Root, who was in um, news radio and uh office space. Set the building on fire yes it makes people <laughs> he um he said he was at a um Limber, a promotional Limber. thing for news radio and two guys walked up with red swing line staplers and asked him to sign it and he was like he said i just had this confused thing of is this a prop from news radio that i don't don't know about and they were like no no office space and he said all of a sudden i realized that there's something about this office space thing that I hadn't really realized. And these guys stood there and talked to me for five minutes, quoted lines. They knew everything I had done. They knew all the stuff about my character. And as they're talking, there are other people coming up going, Hey, that's that dude. And so you, you know, for him, that was something simple and kind of a throwaway part that he didn't think went anywhere. And all of a sudden it became his most iconic role. One of them, certainly. Yeah. And at the time, nobody knew anything about that movie. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you just you just don't know. And 
And I think too, we're, we're kind of in an interesting time because when you think back on it, our parents never had the opportunity to just go, Hey, remember that TV show from when I was a kid, um, you know, in 1947, let's go watch that where right. we have the opportunity to do a lot of that now. Mm-hmm. And so our nostalgia is a little bit different from, from past generations too. So it, it's kind of a, kind of an interesting time to be alive and it's an interesting time to be in this world of podcasting and, and, you know, kind of making our, our art based on someone else's art in some ways. Um, it's kind of a, kind of a cool thing to be able to do. Well, let me ask this because I want to dovetail on that as we start to kind of wind down the interview piece here, we're getting close to that segment. We've got a few more things to go and Dustin's going to hang out with us. But Dustin, since you're sort of in a producer role or or certainly a technical post-production role, I know Jeff does a lot to help try to get guests. Is there still that? Because I'll tell you, I feel it. I still feel I won't ever be nervous with a guest, but I'm always blown away by someone who wants to commit to be part of my show or, you know, our show. Do you feel that same way when you get a guest, when you bring somebody on, especially somebody go, I remember seeing them when I was a kid and now I'm interviewing them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, when we did, we did an interview, uh, in February with Joel Murray, uh, Bill Murray's brother. And that I loved, um, you know, all all of the Murray brothers and everything growing up, you know, if they were in it, I was watching it. Mm -hmm. And so to have him come on and know that he was going to be on and we knew about a week ahead, it was like, nerve wracking. (laughs) It was so weird. I would set up at night, just thinking about what I was going to ask him, (laughs) what we were going to talk about. We get to the interview. I don't think I asked him anything that I thought of during that entire week. It was more just, you know, let him run, let him run with a couple of stories. And, but it was fun. It was, but in this setup with the zoom, you know, the era of zoom that we're in now, um, you know, seeing a familiar face on a screen in front of you, is not something new, but being able to communicate with that face on that screen is completely new. And so that aspect of it was, was kind of uh, interesting. I think that's what threw me off. If I'd have, if we'd have been in the studio and he had come in and I shook his hand and, you know, Mm -hmm. take our masks off and said, hello, or, you know, anything like that, then yeah, I think it would have had a different, you know, a little different impact, but Mm. uh, you're still in that television screen um, you know, kind of mindset when you're talking to these people. So it does take some of the, you know, I met this person, you know, shine away. I think it takes a little bit of it off, but, um, but still to sit down with, you know, these, some of these people, like we interviewed um, uh, Scott Ryan from Mr. In Between, Australian um, hitman t- television show on FX. And he's very intimidating on the show. And then you realize when you're talking to the guy, he's the exact same person, just not a hitman. He's an actor, <laughs> but with the same mindset and the same you know cadence and everything when you're talking to him. And so, yeah, you have these you have these preconceived um, uh, nerves mm-hmm. about about someone, and then to find out that those are are adequate. Yeah, you know, to have those, you know, to be that nervous and to say things in front of people, uh, it, it it is. Um, it is a good thing. You know, we haven't had the problem of meeting your, your, uh, you know, being a fan of someone and then meeting them and then that being completely thrown out because they're, you know, a jerk. You know, we haven't had that issue yet. And that's the one thing that always is in the back of my head when we have these interviews is I hope this conversation doesn't ruin how I think about this person for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, I will tell you from my perspective, and although Zoom never is exactly the same as being in the same room, because I do love live radio, I do love live interview, because mm-hmm. you get the presence. It's sort of like being on stage. You get the feeling, like whether you're whether you're a musician or an actor, you feed off of what your audience, because you've got them right there. But you right. do have more flexibility of getting maybe better guests than you normally would who wouldn't fly to your particular studio or be available to be in person. And so... It's sort of the double-edged sword, and I very much have enjoyed everybody we've been able to pull on, you, you included. I mean, bringing in a voice and a talent that I listen to. I'll, I'll mow the lawn every <laughs> every week, and I'm like, 
here's the guys from Radio Labyrinth, or here's a podcast I'm listening to. They're breaking down The Great Escape. That's what I'm watching, binging right now, is that they're breaking down that classic, you know, movie from the 60s. And I, I'm, I'm always both, I feel it's surreal, and yet the most comforting thing in the world to be able to say, look, they're here with us. We're just chilling and chatting and having a good time. It's fun. Yeah. All right. As we start to wrap up the interview piece, and of course, like with everybody with phone friends and everything, as things evolve and change, we'll be more than happy to have you back. Right now, we always try to do this with a show or somebody who's in the middle of a career that's moving in an arc or wherever they're headed. You've helped bring Radio Labyrinth into the YouTube era. You're bringing it into live video. You've been doing a lot with their social media. So, Dustin, you, resource to Radio Labyrinth, where do you see the show in the next maybe one to three years? Um, <clears throat> I see us uh, getting going more with uh, guests and becoming more of, of, a, of an interview process. At the same time, the podcast portion, I would love to see it be a little more structured and bringing in uh, sketches, uh, utilizing Tim's talents of his voice, bringing in some animation uh, on top of uh, some of his voices. Um, you know, making it more like as far as the YouTube show, making it more like a television show that we used to watch growing up. That's, you know, variety hour type uh, format. That's that's where I would like to see it go. Um, but the podcast is the podcast. I mean, I mean, in the, for what it is, uh, you know, it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, but maybe try to shine it up a little bit. That's kind of been my. Attitude. You know, one of the things we talked about with Jeff, the podcast kind of morphs over time. Things change. It used to have more guests than it moved away from guests than it moved back to guests. So I think being aware of the nuances of where things go and not being afraid to make changes, I think is important. And that's I think that's what Tim wanted me. I think he wanted me to. To be able to bring my ideas into the group. And maybe expand them. I know maybe from a band standpoint, it would be like bringing in a new member that has some more ideas that mm -hmm. can help things expand. And and that's that's what we've done. And and so far, so good. Excellent. Well, you got anything else for our our guests before we move on to your movie review? No, the only thing I would I was going to say is just that I've been a long time Radio Labyrinth listener and y'all just continue to do a great job. And I think one of the things I appreciate the most about the show format or no format, whatever is the chemistry uh, between everybody in the room. Absolutely. Um, I, it, it really is like you said at the beginning, that feeling of sitting down and just listening to your friends, shoot the bull. And to me, that is like the best way to just kind of blow steam out and, you know, after a day of listening to CNN and Fox News and and all the crazy crap going on in the world and walks in, watching shit like Toxic Shark, um, <laughs> to be able to listen to it. I'm getting a sense of where we're going. In the movie <laughs> That's called <laughs> foreshadowing. That <laughs> yeah, was pretty clear. <laughs> um, not much shadow. <laughs> no, not much shadow. Um, but you, you do have that sense of of being in a room with people who you're friends with. And, uh, and I always do really appreciate that about the show. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. All right. Well, Dustin's going to hang out with us. We're going to continue our show. And one of the things we do right as we move from guest say interview is we go to our movie review. Now, folks, if you're brand new to the listening audience, you've been here because you heard about Dustin joining the show. You're a big radio labyrinth fan. So this is your first time listening. We actually have a private listeners group. It's on Facebook. Our public page is facebook.com forward slash the wilder ride, but you can choose or you can request to join the private group. And if you get to come inside and it's real easy, you just have to answer a couple of questions that make sure you're not a bot. You can participate in our weekly poll and Walt, our movie segment. It's a segment we like to call. You had the opportunity to have three movies voted on. What movie won out this week? Okay, so I, I think I need to figure out how to take the, the poll down when I'm done. Uh, because it once again, we had one of those weeks <laughs> where uh, we voted. And then, um, you know, so I watched this horrible movie called Toxic Shark. 
And then I came back later and indigenous had three more votes. So I, I, I don't know what to do with that. Um, but toxic shark won at seven o'clock on Sunday night, when I sat down to watch this piece of cinematic wonder. And, um, so I'm going to put Insidious on again next week uh, just to see if it wins against uh, uh, what was that lava chihuahua or whatever that the- lava lantula lava lantula <laughs> God yeah yeah lo- uh, lava lantula so it, yeah you can guess it is a giant spider that shoots lava at people who are looking at not a spider but a giant green screen nice. <laughs> I wonder if it'll be like Sharkosaurus versus whatever, where they didn't really stage it very well and people were running the wrong direction. And Oh, that is exactly what it is. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and, and they had the budget for a boat. So oh, there, nice. there's, there, there is a, yeah. How you get a, a tarantula in the middle of the ocean. You just have to watch and see. It's science. <laughs> Hashtag Science. Science. <laughs> Well, Toxic Shark is um, a solid 3.3 out of 10 on IMDb. It's 0.2 higher than last week. 0.2 higher. (laughs) Not any better for sure. I mean, we we go from ice spiders to Toxic Sharks. I mean, come on. Yeah, they're really basically the same movie. Um, This one, (laughs) a tropical singles retreat takes a terrifying turn. When guests realize a poisonous shark is infesting the surrounding water, not only will it rip apart its victims, but it also uses projectile acid to hunt in and out of the water. Because the shark's teeth and sense of uh, of attacking its prey has survived for millions and millions of years, but now it needs an advancement. Exactly. So it shoots green acidic bile on people. This is a hard movie to watch um, just because it's not interesting and it's very predictable. But <clears throat> there is something interesting about the uh, the stars. Cabby Borders, Christina Masterson, and Michelle Cortez. None of them have ever won an Oscar, nor will they ever win an Oscar, <laughs> nor should they even be allowed to watch the Oscars because <laughs> none of them can act for anything. <laughs> it well, is this. Because a lot of times unknown females may, they may be in for other reasons. They are in this movie for other reasons. Okay. It is not their acting ability. Okay. And I, I emphasize it is not their acting ability. So well, maybe they, the promise of a sandwich afterwards. That is correct. That is exactly <laughs> why they're there. Are, are they at least visually qualified to be in a movie? They definitely are. And the odd thing is, you know, for um, for Cabby Borders, she's been in The Founder, uh, Game Night, uh, Love is Blind. She's been Wait, in Game actual Night. movies. That was that movie with Jason. Um, uh, Jason Bateman. Bateman. Yeah. 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 And uh, so, you know, that was filmed in Georgia. Like they, the whole airport scene was filmed at the Cartersville Airport Game Night. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Well. Cabby we went from that, that next to <laughs> Toxic Shark, and uh, her, her, <laughs> her. Are we career, sure Toxic Shark wasn't filmed on Lake Lanier? <laughs> <laughs> the shark would have died. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't have made it. That toxic, the toxic lake would have eaten the toxic shark. Right, it, right. It's like, hey, I may shoot toxin, but I don't want to live in it. <laughs> yeah, and. You know, every time you think you've kind of got this movie pinned down that like, okay, it really can't get any dumber or whatever. It gets dumber. And there was really a time when I was thinking, if director Cole Sharp was sitting next to me, what would I say to him? There were a couple of times I was like, did y'all not have a script you were shooting from? (laughs) Did you not have any good ideas? And then I will tell you in the last minute, I would have strangled him because of what happens at the end. It's not a surprise. It is not entertaining. And you just, it pisses you off. It it really just kind of pisses you off because it's like, it's just so dumb. Um, Mm. (laughs) Just to let you know how dumb this movie is. This is sort of a spoiler, but not really. 
if the shark bites you and you don't die, you become a shark zombie and you start trying to eat people. (laughs) (laughs) So it's really that bad. It it just really, really sucks. Like 3.3 is really high for, for what this should have gotten. Um, like this should have been like a 0.3. I just imagine, Hey guys, I just got done watching the walking dead. Check out. Here's something yeah. we can add to our movie. If the shark bites the victim, but doesn't kill them, right. they can now be part of the shark's zombie army. <laughs> right. That, that was exactly it. Dude, that's so cool. <laughs> well, in most writer's rooms, people would be like, no, you leave now. <laughs> you suck at ideas. <laughs> Yeah, very very rarely do these movies have multiple writers. Most of the time, it's one guy's weird, you know, thing that he wrote in his basement, and it and it gets made. Who I feel sorry for are the editors that have to put this piece of crap together. Right? Yeah, the the editors That's- on this had to be suicidal towards the end. <laughs> um, the writer is actually a woman. Her name is Ashley O'Neill, and. She is known for such things as I spit on your grave. That's not a bad flick. And that's about reboot. it. Was it the reboot, I guess? Or oh my gosh. Guess what she was the writer for, Dustin? What's that? Lava Lantula. <laughs> there you see. Bring it back around. <laughs> Could you couldn't plan that any better? She I'm, has four credits. Two of them are Toxic Shark and Lava Lantula. I'm going to guess she's found her niche and is getting paid no matter what. She's still getting paid for her, her script to be made. Well, yeah. The three things that she has written, Toxic Shark, La Valanchula, and Earth Tastrophe. <laughs> and then she was just additional crew on I Spit on Your Grave. Okay, so she didn't write I Spit on Your she Grave. She did okay. not write. Yeah, she I just made the grave. spit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> she, was, she was the spit person. <laughs> She was <laughs> okay. We are dragging this out. We are making the move. We're making the segment about the movie longer than the movie, <laughs> and probably better than the but movie. But not as long as the movie feels. <laughs> true. I will true. tell you that it 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 felt really really long. It it I think it was, uh, gosh, oh, an hour and twenty seven minutes. Ooh. Um. It, they could have stopped it an hour and I'd have been fine. They could have cut out all the zombie stuff. They could have cut out the, eh, they could have cut out a lot of stuff. Um, there were several times, you know, when you're climbing a mountain and you, you keep hitting false peaks, this movie, you keep hitting false ends. You think it's done. And then there's more and there's more and it hurts more and more every time. Yeah. And but then, with movies like aliens or Terminator, you feel like that's a payoff. In this, it feels like it's not. This is a punishment. <laughs> Makes you appreciate the bad ending that happened five minutes ago. Yes, it really That's does. That's what it does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> if the ending's not good, just make the multiple endings after it that much worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good it's, idea. You know, it's, it's a backwards way of doing it, but hey. It is a backwards and way of doing it. It's unique. And if you said it was 87 minutes, that makes sense because that's the 88-minute uh, mark is the um, the key for uh, – sci-fi channel movies like uh, for the amount of yeah. commercials they can have to do it exactly a two-hour feature yeah that makes sense and i think that's exactly what they were shooting for um because well, i think this of, this was on sci-fi network yeah and mm-hmm. but a lot of times i'll tell you the editors will do that as well they'll clip things and maybe that's sometimes why you feel like God, what, what this doesn't make any sense it's like well we're just trying to make it fit the two-hour mark Right. With, why did it have credits with the black background for the first three minutes of the movie? It's like, yeah, they didn't have any more footage and they had to hit a we, certain mark. We needed three more minutes. Slow well, the music down. It's yeah. um, what was that pastor movie? Uh, Velocipastor. Velocipastor. Um, oh, God. It's kind of like that where it says insert an explosion. Yeah, they left the slide in there where they forgot to put a they forgot to put the uh, the, the, the effect. It was a reminder to the editor. Here's where the effect goes. Ah, screw it. I'll get to that. Yeah, later. he was at launch at that. It was point. a deadline. So they I know to, what I mean. I gotta get this. I gotta get this out. <laughs> I dropboxed it too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I'm guessing uh, that's a nine on this one. I mean, like as a no, as in Germans, uh, no, no. For, what do I care, Alan? If they want to watch it, that's on them. 
Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> no, don't watch it. It's it's really <laughs> dumb. If it if it comes on sci-fi late at night, you've just come in from a long shift, you know, you just blazed one or you had a few uh, adult beverages. Uh, sure. You know, <laughs> it, it's better than some other stuff that's on TV. Um, you know, it's better than the Oprah network or. Um, oh, wow. We've just lost some of the audience. Or the news, you know. Okay, I'll go better than the news. <laughs> it's better than the, it's, better, <laughs> it's it's better than most of the stuff on the shopping network. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what the heck? Give it a shot. It's uh, right. it, it's you know there are parts you'll 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 laugh at some parts that you that weren't really intended to be funny. Um, <laughs> and yeah, give it a shot. I mean, if you last thirty minutes, it's not the worst thirty minutes of your life, but. Okay. Uh, but it's not worth sitting down and watching the movie intentionally. All right. Well, let's move to our, our, our now news segment, a chance for Walt and I to scour the net looking for some interesting news items. And we know they're true because we found them online. It's a segment we like to call. It's no bullshit. Walt, you've got the first news story. We do. I do. And it's from the Oregon from Oregon live.com who has provided us with some great news this year. Oregon's definitely different than origami. And yeah, or the origami life would be even better. Unless we are in Oregon and it's an origami, in which case maybe that goes together. That may go together very well. So, uh, well, this one, it's Oregon Live, but it's an Alabama story. An okay. Alabama man thought he'd been shot by an intruder. It turns out it was his wife's boyfriend secretly living in their house. Inconceivable. <laughs> oh, goodness. An Alabama man was shot by his wife's boyfriend, who was secretly <laughs> living in the couple's home, officials say. The Mobile County Sheriff's Office said the wife told her husband that an intruder was in their Crayola home Sunday night, and he armed himself with a gun. Wait, it's a Crayola home? It's made out of crayons? Or? I guess so. <laughs> Crayola, Crayola. The man, the men, get this, this is really classic. The men shot each other and both went to the hospital, the news outlet reported. The sheriff's office said Michael Ambacker, the wife's boyfriend for over a year, had been living at the house shortly before the shooting, WALA reported. She, <laughs> she had been allowing him to stay within the home for a couple of days, providing him food, Mobile Sheriff's Office Captain Paul Birch told WKRG. There were bottles of urine in the room, which indicated he'd been in there for a little while. Oh, that's not right. Don't come out. My husband never goes in this room. <laughs> <laughs> the sheriff's wait, office wait, hadn't wait, uncovered a motive. Alab Hold on. In true Alabama fashion, my son died and he never goes in this room. So you can have his room. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's horrible. I, I that's think our, that was that's our beady baby room. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I keep the Elvis prints. <laughs> The sheriff's office hadn't uncovered a motive for the wife's telling her husband that Amaker was an intruder, WKRG reported. Investigators said she was too intoxicated to be interviewed after the shooting. <laughs> the news outlet reported uh, Amaker is in jail on charges of attempted murder, possession of a firearm with an altered serial number, and possession of a controlled substance. It's no. <laughs> okay maybe we should have saved that one for last i don't think i have either one of my stories are gonna top that one that's, just, that's comedy gold someone get that to tim he could do all the voices in a sketch about yes, that could. particular story in fact i think i'm gonna save this one for saturday when i fill in for you on a wbhf you should do it <laughs> that is comedy gold i absolutely am i could just see it now so she's stashing her boyfriend in the house in the room that her husband never goes into but she gets so drunk and then gets ticked off and ends up <laughs> sending her husband to go kill the boyfriend i hear someone in the house that'll teach you to not come and take care of my corns and my feet oh it, it makes alabama sense to me <laughs> it does it does follow alabama logic <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a, a different story. You know, I've always uh, I love uh, being in the ocean. You know, one of my things is to eventually become certified as a, a diver, a dive master. Love being underwater. And of course, one of the things I always talk about is be careful about sea snakes, because sometimes a sea, a sea snake may come after you. And of course, because they're venomous, that's always a problem. Well, one person decided to take it upon themselves to find out 
Well, just why is that? Why do some sneeze sneak? Why do some sea snakes come and attack people? Come to find out when they started looking at the data and the patterns of when these particular attacks were taking place, it happened to be right around mating season. That's when oh. the most prevalent attacks were. Well, why would they come after you? Well, come to find out, much like in real life, when a male goes after a female, sometimes the female isn't in the mood and the female hides. <laughs> And that frustrates the male snake, who then may take it out on the next closest object available. <laughs> so, according to the scientists here, the sea snakes aren't really upset at you. They're just too horny to think straight. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> they go for the first object and will sometimes wrap themselves around divers' fins. Now, what the, what the research is showing is they'll recognize after a few moments, okay, you're not just a bigger version of the female snake I was chasing and I will go my way. So they said not to swim away from it because that's what the female did in the first place to take it off and not to do anything to try to hit it. That most sea snakes will eventually learn and go away. The hard part is trying to convince yourself when you've got a venomous sea snake coming after you to try to just sit still and let it figure out that you're not the amorous affection that he was intent on spending the night with. But I thought it was an interesting story that Maybe the reason that there are sea snakes attacking isn't because that they're actually after the people. It's because they just got denied a little hoochie in the sack. It's no bullshit. Best thing you can do, Clark, is just let him finish. <laughs> True that. All right. Well, all right. So Charlotte Fire provides... <laughs> Provides Obi-Wan Kenobi with records in quick order. Hello there. So a little bit of background on this one. In Charlotte, North Carolina, whenever you turn in a um, a request to get information from the government, they are notoriously slow in getting it back to you. But WBTV reports that a bizarre battle over public records at Charlotte's fire department <laughs> provides an example of just how quickly some records can be produced. WBTV has reported extensively on how long it takes the city of Charlotte to produce emails and other communications, and there appears to be new resolve to fix the issue. In a sea of records requests submitted to the city of Charlotte, one stands out as a new hope for quick for quickly <laughs> for how quickly emails and texts from city employees could be produced to the public. It was submitted January 22nd, 2020 by a certain O. W. Kenobi. <laughs> but how this request was handled quickly turned to the dark side. <laughs> this is great. Tim Bell told WBTV a false name was given. Obviously, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a movie character. The address they gave was at the building here in Union Hall, <laughs> which we would never give as an address when we were asking for a FOIA request. So Obi-Wan actually gave the fire department's address as the address of where to send this FOIA request to. Um, he asked for an extreme amount of information. The request was for all emails, texts, and photos on the city-owned phone for the battalion chief, Shame Nance. WBT, uh, WBTV has previously rep reported that it is the kind of request that would normally take months, if not a year or more, to fulfill. But in this case, it just took six weeks to produce 807 pages of text, pictures, and more. Bell says those records were produced even quicker than normal, and they were actually produced within a week and published to Mr. Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Obviously, they were hoping for something sensitive, but they are sorely embarrassed. So if you're putting in a, uh, a request in Charlotte... Use the moniker Obi-Wan Kenobi and uh, your request will be heard faster. It's no bullshit. You don't need to see my identification. <laughs> well, and if you're the fire chief who they're looking for his information, you might want to look at that fire chief a little closer because that sounds like somebody who I can't find my text. <laughs> well, how can I get? Well, just send in and I'll have him send it here to the fire station. <laughs> <laughs> I lost that picture and I got to get it back. Hmm. Obi-Wan. I haven't gone by that in a long time. These people call me old Ben. Obi-Wan. <laughs> I haven't submitted a FOIA request under that moniker in 
in a in long years. time. <laughs> All right. Well, I did this. Uh, I found this story that was a compilation of some of the most dramatic truck spills so far this year. I mean, weird truck spills. It's something we hear about sometimes in the news. Innumerable trucks and trailers transport thousands, if not millions of pounds of goods over the highways all across the country. So with such vast numbers of vehicles, it's no wonder sometimes they get into accidents. And when a truck is damaged, there's a good chance that some of the cargo ends up on the road. In the best case scenario, the spill is harmless to traffic and can, can and traffic can continue moving. Other times, though, the truck might be transporting something more unusual. And that's the kind of stuff that scatters all over the road. And so here are some of the best. We'll go to just a couple of weeks ago, August the 3rd, early in the morning, New Albany, Mississippi. Notice that some of the town's roads were covered in sand. What they might not have realized was it was for their own protection. Because around 3.30 in the morning, officers from the New Albany Police Department arrived to the scene of the accident near Highway 15. When they got there, they discovered the roads were slick with a strange substance. The liquid turned out to be chicken fat. Holy cow. Tons and tons of slippery accident inducing chicken fat. And the only way they could figure out was to get the Mississippi Department of Transportation to much like with oil slicks in your garage, spread sand on top of it. So that's what that was. We go over to Florida now, July the 20th, a little earlier this year. Interstate 95 near Rock Ledge, Florida became the scene of an accident that got nasty. Very, very nasty. Uh, Somebody better look and see if Biff was chasing anybody in a DeLorean because a semi-truck and a dump trunk collided at the mile marker 195 location and both vehicles were completely wrecked carrying cow manure, spilling it all over the roadways. It really was, quote, a shitty situation. (laughs) And finally, it's not just Americans who know how to crash trucks. If you'd been to A14 Highway near God Manchester, England, on June the 2nd, you might have thought thousands of lives had been lost. That's because the collision of two trucks left the road surface covered in what looked like gallons upon gallons of blood and gore. You may be wondering why the red suit. Well, that's so bad guys can't see me bleed. But not to worry, no one actually died in this accident. The red stuff was actually several tons of tomato puree and olive oil that one of the trucks was transporting. When mixed with dirt and sand on the road, it looked like human remains all chummed up on the roadway. It's amazing. It's astounding. But it's no bullshit. So there you are. A story, a a compilation of some of the most interesting truck spills that have happened so far in 2021. I dug deep for those, by the way. That's good. (laughs) All right. Let's cruise to our last segment. It's a segment we call our entertainment segment. And this is where we get everybody up to speed on what we've been watching, what we've been reading, and what we've been listening to. And we'll go with Walt first. We'll go. uh, I'll go second. Our guest third. We'll go through first watching. Walt, what have you been watching this week? Well, I... I may have mentioned this before, but there is a great show on Netflix called Heist, and it's about heists. Um, it's is it an uh, actual heist, like looking at actual things that have happened? Yeah, like um, a $13 million theft from a uh, Brinks truck. Um, I-, I didn't even know about this one. I, I'm kind of into, you know, real crime stuff. And one of the... One of the cases I'd just never heard of was a huge heist from the Buffalo Trace Distillery in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. They got tens of thousands of bottles of stuff that was like really high end old bourbon, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the Van Winkle stuff, some Buffalo Trace. So these guys that were just like warehouse workers were stealing the stuff left and right. Some of the bottles were worth like $10,000 each. And (laughs) it is a fascinating case. Just how uh, this random auditor came in and she said, you know, you seem to be missing some things. And all of a sudden this thing broke and all these guys ended up in prison. And uh, basically it all came down to them all being on the same softball team after work. And that's where all this theft stuff was going on so really interesting show definitely worth watching very entertaining kind of shows you 
the stupidity of some criminals. Uh, but also, if you're a business owner, you're going to be locking the doors a lot tighter after watching this. Uh, also, the Santa Clarita Diet. Have you ever watched that show? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm re-watching it right now. Is again, one of those I was like, I'm just going to watch one or two episodes, and I was hooked in again. So if you've never watched it or if you're looking for something that you have watched, you might want to watch again, that's a great one. I really hate that that got canceled. I, it, it just went away at the end of season two, and I think it had some more life left in it. But um, And then a, a documentary I've been watching, it's called Inventing David Geffen. Have either one of y'all watched this? Mm-mm. No, buddy of mine turned me on to it was just saying how great it is. And he's one of those people that I've always heard his name around entertainment stuff, but never really knew that much about him. But it is a fascinating documentary, really, really entertaining. So uh, take the time if you're into documentaries to check that out. What was it Um, called again? Inventing David Geffen. Okay. And really real fascinating. Um, just the time in history where he was in entertainment and the things he got away with and did is very well done documentary. And you can find that on Netflix. All right. For me, I finally watched Val about the, the Val Kilmer project. Oh, yeah. Val Kilmer How's that goes through. Mm-hmm. It's really, really good. And you would think, and I kept thinking this the whole time, is this just a vanity thing? Am I supposed to somehow get something out of this? I mean, cause he's saying, I've been filming myself since I was eight years old. My, my brother. But you know what? It's really, really good. Mm. If you get a chance to check out Val, uh, it's, you don't even have to like him as an actor. Just his story, some of his behind the scenes footage, the stuff he captures on camera. Um, it's pretty amazing. So I would check out Val. Uh, uh, well worth the watch. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, about our YouTube fascinations, and I still have my my go to's. Um, Ashley Burton, who is a Tennessean millennial who doesn't know anything about any movies that were made. Sometimes I think even 10 years ago, she's like, I don't know how sheltered she is, but she just watched Never Ending Story, Big and Forrest Gump. Fantastic reactions, especially to Forrest Gump, not knowing that story. And she said, I admit, I've heard of it. I know all about it. I know the memes. I know the name. I even knew Tom Hanks. I just never watched it. And to watch her reactions, it was just touching. Yeah, she's one of my she's one of my favorites. Yeah, she. I watch I watch her every every week. She's great, and I can't wait because she's getting ready to do. Uh, she does her uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe now, and mm-hmm. her own. She's eventually doing all the movies, and I can't wait. She's on to Avengers, which will be out after. Well, it'll come out before this is released. So as we're talking about it, we're still waiting for it to come out later this week. Uh, Popcorn in Bed is one I've really enjoyed. It's a, a young girl from Canada. And she's very sweet and innocent. She's only and she admits I was only raised on rom-coms. And so now I'm reaching out. Uh, She was completely shocked and just saddened. She and her sister actually sat in and watched the movie Fury, the World War II tank flick with uh, Brad Pitt. Great, great movie. And she Mm -hmm. just did Blade Runner, the 1982 Harrison Ford Blade Runner. Uh, Didn't like it, but that's not to be surprised because it's, it's really hard to really grasp what you're watching the very first time you watch Blade Runner, especially if you're watching the final cut where it gets rid of all of the voiceover, which can be helpful for somebody who maybe isn't into film noir or certainly into cyberpunk, which is really what that world is set into. But she did pick up on some of the themes and a lot of people on her channel said, you need a rewatch. It's one of those movies you got to watch a few times to really take it all in. Uh, Daily Doug, who was one of the guests this season, uh, he did Metallica's Blackened for a metal Monday, which was great from and justice for all. But the cool thing about it, and I'm bringing it up now is he said it was because his brother stumbled upon a YouTube uh, channel called project Metallica. And one of the things these guys did in this YouTube channel is they went through and justice for all, and they went and remixed the bass, and they called it and justice for Jason, because when Jason Newstead joined the band after the death of bassist Cliff Burton, The band almost intentionally toned uh, Jason's bass down so much you hardly even notice it. Put too much compression on the drums, in my opinion. It just is a horribly mixed album. It's great, the music. It's just horribly mixed. They remixed it, and you can actually hear the bass guitar. Well worth checking out if you're a fan of Metallica. It's called Project Metallica on YouTube, and you can hear actual bass strings from Jason Newstead on those cuts. Wow, very cool. I got two more. I stumbled across two music reaction people that I really like. A husband and wife team 
Rob Squad reactions, just music videos, music songs. It's really cool to watch them. And another guy that does the same thing, Jamal, a.k.a. Jamal. Very cool stuff. Uh, a guy who really is into a lot of really neat music, but it's just kind of fun to watch their reactions. Yeah, I like Jamal as well. They, I, 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 you, we, we watch a lot of the similar YouTube people. There we go. Well, because we like good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and Jamal, of course, if, you, if you've been watching Jamal for a long time, he lost his entire channel and had to start completely over. YouTube completely locked all of his videos out. I didn't know that and he had Why? to start completely over. Yeah. So he's, he's gone through a lot. Um, but yeah, love him. Love him. Um, let's see. What am I into right now? I've started watching uh, reservation dogs on Hulu. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Takeda Watiti. Okay. That did um, he executive produced this. It's about uh, a group of uh, kids that live on an Indian reservation and they want to get out of the Indian reservation. So they, Try. They tried all these different crimes to make money in order to escape, and it's a calamity. Um, and uh, it's really good. They they throw in a lot of pop pop culture references uh, in what they're doing. They do a lot of mock ups from movies, uh, Quentin Tarantino esque stuff, and um, it, it's it's really fun. Uh, there's only I think they're doing it week by week on Hulu, and there's only like four episodes out at this point. Okay, uh, or by the time you hear this. Um, so let's see, that's really good. Uh, Ted Lasso, I finally bit the bullet and started watching that. And it is like a warm blanket. Um, that is probably the best TV show I've seen in the last five or six years. Uh, in my opinion, it's a great show because it's so simplistic in that one person with a positive attitude can change the lives of everyone around him uh, just by being the better person. And, and, and that, that blew me away because when I read it, when I first got Apple plus, it was on there immediately at, at its inception. And I put off watching it for you know, over a year, I guess. And uh, finally, you know, Jeff and, and uh, Steph talked about it so much that I started watching it, binged the whole thing. Um, I haven't started season two yet because I want to let it do the same thing. I want to let it so I can watch it straight through. Um, but great show. Everyone in it's really good. Um, what else? A UFO on Showtime. It's J.J. Abrams uh, documentary series. He got a four part documentary series. Uh, it goes through uh, all the through history, the history since Roswell on up about UFOs. But he does it uh, in a very uh, stylized way. You know, J.J. Abrams, go figure. Um, But he does it. The cool part about it to me is that he took all of this footage that you always see that's so shaky or blurry and spent J.J. Abrams money with J.J. Abrams, you know, uh, abilities and straightened all the the uh, the shots out, stabilized everything, zoomed everything in. So you can really see. A lot more. And there's some amazing stuff on there, especially since, you know, the Pentagon has released stuff recently. Mm -hmm. And that was that was really it was released right after that. So you I think the last episode, the fourth episode has some of that stuff included. Um, And if you're a conspiracy theory, UFO kind of guy, I've always been interested in that stuff. And this was kind of like the best collection of that type of material that I've ever seen. I mean, it's if you want to convince someone and, and want to show them something other than just a shaky TikTok, um, this would definitely be uh, what to watch. It's a, uh, it's called UFO. It's on Showtime uh, from JJ Abrams. And I just finished uh, Stephen King's new book, uh, Billy Summers. Now, is that under the reading um, portion or is that is audio? It, it's audio. Okay. So yeah, well, I, I yeah, I listen. I I drive all day long, so you know, podcasts and audiobooks are my only so entertainment hold, during the day. Hold that for when we get to what are you either listening to or or reading. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're just doing you. the watching first. So watching first. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, I wa- I just watched uh, the Empty Man on HBO Max. It's a horror film. Um, I thought it was going to be very Candyman esque mm-hmm. um you know kind of an urban legend a guy that comes after you if you do xyz <laughs> it, you know this will happen um but it it was a different spin on it um and it was actually 
pretty good. Um, if you're into uh, like um, HP Lovecraft kind of yeah. uh, cosmic horror, um, it was it was really good along those lines. I mean, it wasn't as good as like Mandy or The Color of Space, but um, it was it was kind of that mixed with the Candyman type uh, scenario, and it's called The Empty Man on HBO Max. Cool. All right, let's move to what we're reading, if anything. Walt, we'll go to you. Anything you're reading this week? I'm still working my way through the same stuff. The um, the two books, the Star Trek um, book, which I, I guess I'm going to be reading for the next two years, a little bit <laughs> at a time, and the book on the um, the American um, road trips. It, it's real good, and I'm totally drawing a blank on the name of that book, but don't make me pull over. That's it. Don't make me pull over. Yeah, it's really funny. Good book. Uh, definitely worth the time. You know, it's, it's kind of a good sit around for 30 minutes and um, read something mindless. It's really cool. All right. Only thing I've read and it's part of a part of our, uh, you know, one of the things I do is with my wife, we do the marriage fit podcast and we touched on this uh, a couple of episodes back and I wanted to do a little more research and reading because I know where my opinion is as a parent and raising children, especially now that all of ours are grown. We only have one left and she's a sophomore in college. So hopefully she doesn't come back like the other ones have managed to figure out how to survive on their own. <laughs> but I uh, read a great article that sort of backed up uh, our assumptions. It's called The Importance of Being a Parent, Not a Friend by Eden Ponce. And it's really all about how teenagers are in a very strange, weird place in their brains and their biochemistry. So much is happening we all know that Gen Xers and our boomer parents all know that, but we're living in a time where you've got parents who think the kids should be allowed to decide all of these really super important things that could have ramifications for their entire lives. And they are not prepared to make those weighty decisions. And it's really about parents are there to set guidelines, to be there for the, for the hard, the, the, to make those hard calls and maybe make your child to, you know, say those immortal words, I hate you, but that that's your job. Your job is to be a parent, not a friend. You're there to set the boundaries. You're there to maintain communication. That doesn't mean you need to be a, you know, you don't want to be a, you know, Danny's dad in uh, the, the shining. You want to make sure that you're stable, that you're present, that you're there for them, but not because you're their best friend, because you need to be their guide, because you need to be someone who's lived a little longer and been around the block. And I think it was just a great, great article. And I think it's one of those things a lot more people, especially younger parents, should be paying attention to. You don't let a 10-year-old decide things about their, 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 you just don't let 10 to, 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 to 15 to 17-year-olds make life decisions at that range. They're just not capable. That's it. Dustin, what are you reading? Or listening. Well, I just finished. Or you can put it if you got an audio book, you can put it in listening or you can put it in reading. It's up to you. Um, well, I, I do a lot of driving, so I listen to a lot of audio books. I'll put this one in, in listening. Um, Stephen King's book that just came out, uh, Billy Summers. Uh, it's really good. It's it's kind of the way that Stephen King has been going for his last few books, more uh, detective story than paranormal stories. Uh, and he's a really, you know, excellent writer for character building and and situations. And this one is about a, a hitman, an assassin uh, who's on his last mission. And uh, of course, you know, the last mission, everything goes wrong. Uh, but it's really good. He was an um, uh, a war vet, Iraqi war vet uh, who was a sniper, and he came back and became a paid hitman. And uh, it's very similar to the um, the flow of Barry. If you watch that on HBO mm -hmm. with Bill Hader, mm -hmm. um, very similar uh, storyline. It, it, it made me think of Bill Hader the entire time I was listening to it. But uh, Stephen King, I'm a Stephen King constant reader. So I, I, I constantly read Stephen King books regularly. So um, always good to get a new one. And Billy Summers is the new one. That's that's what I just finished. All right. Let's move into listening. Walt, what are you listening to this week? Could be podcast, could be music, any of the above. Uh, I think I, I think I mentioned this uh, a week or two ago. I, I've, I've kind of started um, getting into a little bit of uh, jazz in the background when I'm doing some work. And um, no, this is the first time I'm hearing it. Okay, well, one of the the albums I came across, I 
I've always heard of John Coltrane as being one of the the greats of jazz. Did you do that after finishing up the uh, the Bosch series? Because I did the same freaking thing. You know, it's funny. It must have just embedded somewhere in my mind that John Coltrane was the place to start after mm-hmm. watching that show because I, I got his very best of John Coltrane. <laughs> and I'm finding that playing in the background of all kinds of stuff I'm doing now. Like I, I work in the yard and I've got this album going. And it is just great music. I mean, mm-hmm. it is just fantastic. So I'm going to have to dig a little deeper in the John Coltrane uh, music world. I'm um, drawn to more of the slower, more somber kind of pieces. Uh, when he gets into some of the like just kind of improvisational, little fast stuff, it's not my cup of tea. But so much is just so cool to have on in the background when I'm making dinner. It is so good. Yeah. I mean, it just really sets a great mood for whatever you're doing. Um, so it it is really good. And yeah, I guess we have Bosch to thank for that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and it's, of course, you can get that anywhere. All right. Me listening, uh, got back into it's. I, I, I stumbled across the band a while ago and I decided to get back into them. And I've been watching on YouTube their live performance at Wacken. It's Nightwish. They are so amazing to watch. A symphonic metal band, uh, I believe from Finland. Hmm. Un believable uh, dustin you like reaction videos just do this just pick say reaction to nightwish and just watch people react to nightwish especially when they've got the the latest lead singer they've, they've gone through two other lead singers but the latest one her name is flair jansen it's spelled floor for us americans f-l-o-o-r but flair jansen or probably jansen and just ridiculously trained she can go from operatic style so controlled to putting enough fry and, and, and rage in her voice to go down to the grunge layer and everywhere in between unbelievably good stuff. And, but mixed with drums and guitar and symphony, it's, they really call it symphonic metal, really cool stuff. I'll check that out. Uh, just went through moving pictures. I said, you know what? I'm going to pick a rush album and that may be from front to back. There is no real bad rush album. Let's just face it. But moving pictures may be closest to the top of my favorite rush albums. So that's a good one to listen to if you've not, if you want to get into Rush or you're not sure why so many people love Rush, get Moving Pictures, have your Alexa stream it and listen to it one night and you'll know why. Uh, podcast, The Great Escape Minute. Been listening to that as they are breaking down The Great Escape one minute at a time. Obviously, Radio Labyrinth, our guest today is one of the members and my buddies over across the pond, the 60MW podcast used to be called 60 Minutes With, but they kept getting in trouble because people kept thinking they were the CBS show 60 Minutes. So they just changed it to 60 MW podcast. All right. And Dustin, what are you listening to? Um, let's see. Uh, lately, I've been um, listening music wise. I've been I've dove back into Tom Waits. I'm a huge Waits fan from since I was a kid. Um, and I stopped listening for maybe two or three years. And recently, I've been just jumping back into it and then listening to him in between podcasts and stuff at work. Um, Waits is uh, a genius and, and, and that sums it up for me. Um, the, mu- the musicianship, uh, the way he, he incorporates, uh, language and, and turns it around. He pulls out, uh, phrases from, you know, the twenties and thirties and brings them back into his, uh, lyrics and switches them around. And, um, along with the way he creates his music out of anything, you know, it could be a cardboard box <laughs> and a guitar, um, but he can make it sound. Um, he can make it, he can, he can make you cry by playing a cigar box. So uh, anytime uh, weights is on, that's, that's, that's where, that's what I've been listening to pretty much nonstop for the last couple of months. Excellent. Any other podcasts, anything that you'd like to recommend? Maybe folks that want to stumble across something that you enjoy. Well, as far as um, podcasts go, I, I, I do listen to uh, a lot of the same uh, podcasts that I'm, I'm friends with, but there is a podcast that Tom Segura and his wife um, do called Your Mom's House, uh, and it's it, it kind of uh, he go they go after the funny side of the internet. They'll find uh, funny videos and things like that, and do reactions to them, talk about them, make fun of people. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of one of my indulgence things where, you know, if I'm feeling, uh, 
feeling squirrely, I'll throw on the uh, Your Mom's House podcast and make sure no one's around uh, to listen to it because it's definitely not suitable for work. Um, but it's it's fun because you get to hear comedians that I enjoy, Tom and his wife, Bert Kreischer. Um, you know, he's part of that whole Joe Rogan gang as well. So any of those guys that, um, you know, you can hear them just sitting around talking. Uh, I enjoy just uh, listening to them go off on things that they uh, maybe you wouldn't normally hear them talk about, uh, you know, on a show or uh, at a comedy comedy club. Excellent. Anything else? Um, I, I honestly I spend more time editing now, so I don't have much time to listen to anything if I'm not in a car. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Well, before uh, we let everybody know a little bit more about us for folks who may be stumbling upon this episode and our show for the very first time, Dustin, it has been such a pleasure for both of us to have you on the show. A member of the Radio Labyrinth group. Yeah, it's been great. Let people know a little bit more about where they can either follow you on social media, follow the podcast, anything, all the particulars. Here's your chance to pitch everything about what you're involved with. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys again for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you can follow the the podcast as Radio Labyrinth Podcast on YouTube. Uh, we have our own channel, so uh, just type in Radio Labyrinth Podcast, and that'll bring it up. Um, on Facebook, we have the Radio Shack that I run. It's a it's just the private group for the podcast. You know, it's a it is a private group. So if you come in and you want to talk about things that are a little more blue uh, than your than your public. Uh, news feed. You can you can feel free to know that everyone in there has the same sense of humor, <laughs> uh, and everybody kind of thinks the same way. So, uh, full of Gen Xers that you know don't really follow the same um, concept that you know everyone else seems to have on social media sometimes. Uh, but again, that's Radio Shack, and and you can just type in Radio Shack in Facebook uh, on Twitter. Um, I'm Dustin Lawler, so uh, I got in on Twitter back in uh, 08. So. Mine doesn't have any numbers behind it or spaces or <laughs> funny characters. Uh, just my name. Um, yeah, that's me. Excellent. Walt, for fee- for people that uh, came over, they're big fans of Dustin, the Radio Shack, all the folks out there. They wanted to go, well, let's, let's, let's hear him how he sounds on someone else's show and they're stumbling upon us for the first time. Where can they learn a little bit more about our show? Well, you can find a little bit about us on the interwebs over at wild, the wilderride.com. And uh, we um, we have everything really stored there. All of our um, important information, like past episodes, past guests, uh, things like that, where to find us on other places around the web. And the other place you definitely want to go is our listeners group. It is the, the wild... It is not thewilderride.com. It is facebook.com slash thewilderride. Follow us there, and then a button's going to pop up that is going to say, join our listeners group. Click that button to join our listeners group. It's pretty complicated. <laughs> and then you're going to answer three questions, and we will evaluate whether or not we think you're a robot. If you are not a robot, then we will allow you in, and you can join the fun. We're not going to have any politics, no religion, no uh, stupidity. Well, there is some stupidity, but but of a it's different all, kind. It's a different kind of stupidity. I mean, it's, if you uh, just sat through the, the fun look, kind. if you just sat through the last almost two hours of this and you're still here, then that's what we're talking about. That's where you want to be. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So check us out there. Our listeners group is awesome, and we also have our weekly poll of stupid movies that I get subjected to, and you want to be a part of that. So uh, that is the best place to find us. And as I say, every single week for whether you're listening to Radio Labyrinth, you're listening to The Wilder Ride or any other podcast, take a second to rate and review. That's always good to help those shows that you enjoy. It gives them a little bit of a boost. And more, maybe more importantly, use the share function. You've got your podcatcher out there. You're listening. Just take a few seconds, throw it out on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. You could just hit the button and say, hey, just got done listening to this episode and boop, you're done. It really helps spread the word. You can end up being a, a part of the marketing arm of all of these wonderful shows that you're enjoying. I mean, you're not having to pay anything for it. So what's what's a few seconds of your time? And certainly come on back next week. We've got another brand new guest lined up and in the wings. And actually, it's two guests. It's a returning voice. Caroline from Pod Clubhouse is going to be bringing a guest with her, someone in the set dressing and film industry who she thought would mesh just perfectly with a podcast that likes to break movies down one minute at a time. So you're going to want to come back and check out Beth and Caroline joining us right here, the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. 
Dustin. Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Yeah, and thanks, taking Dustin. Time out of your schedule. Uh, it, no problem, I mean, man. It was fun. It's so cool to hear a, a fan who got pulled in, and, and now you can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in deep now. <laughs> when they've got you editing 12 plus hours of your day or of your week with the video or audio, yeah, I know what that feels like. I get my wife will walk through and she goes, "Are you still working on the same?" I'm like, Babe, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't do it Where you start one night, you start back again the next night. Right. Like, why don't we roll right off your track? Like, why don't we roll right off your track?